Um, okay, so before we uh, get into today's stuff, um, I want to remind everybody that the draft of paper one is due uh, today. The final version is due on Friday. I will give you guys feedback uh, tomorrow afternoon. Um, <clears throat> now for Wednesday, um, from this point out, we're going to be working mostly on that independent writing project that you're going to be doing for the second half of the term. So we're not going to run a traditional class from that. What we're going to do instead, right, is you will still come to this classroom, uh, but because we can't really safely do uh, workshopping together, what we will do uh, is, unless I say otherwise, um, essentially individual 15-minute conferences, right? There are, yeah, there are six people in the class. That should be, um, that should roughly cover the, cover the time. So what we're going to be doing for next time, right, I want you to think about the subject that you want to choose for your independent research project, right? You don't have to come up with a preliminary thesis yet, right? You don't necessarily have to know exactly what you want to write about or what you want to say about this thing, but I want you to choose a subject, right? And I want you to think about a couple of potential research questions that you might pursue. Right, in order to come up with a thesis, right? So remember that a research question must be, on the one hand, arguable, right? Right, it has to be based on something that is arguable, that people could disagree about, right? And that can be proven with evidence, that can be demonstrated with evidence, right? Also needs to concern something in your chosen text that is not immediately obvious to a reader, right? So you need to think about something that a reader would need to have pointed out to them in order to notice, right? You would have to read very, very carefully to notice, right? So for example, the sort of thing, that, the sort of questions that you, that you need to be asking, right? Um, I recently had an article accepted um, on The Hobbit. And the thing that interested me about the novel, at least this time that I read it, was the way the character Gandalf used language, right? I noticed that Gandalf was always pointing out ambiguities in language use um, or you know, questionable interpretations of meaning or assigning linguistic value to things more or less arbitrarily. Like, for example, deciding that Bilbo Baggins is a burglar despite the fact that he has no characteristics of that role at the time that Gandalf meets him, right? But then he grows into the role and is assigned to him by the word. So <clears throat> the big broad question that I started with is how does Gandalf's unusual language use the world of the novel, right? Other things I thought about included um, what are possible theoretical sources for Gandalf's use of language. And 
and to what extent does the novel seem to endorse Gandalf's ideas about life? So from this set of preliminary questions, right, like so this sort of gave me something to focus on as I went through the novel, right, a problem to try to solve using evidence from the novel, right? So what I hit upon was Tolkien's <clears throat> own, you know, own uh, profession as a scholar of languages, right? And the prominence of structuralism as a linguistic theory at the time Tolkien began writing this novel, right? So essentially, in some ways, uh, part of what I came up with is that Gandalf's language use as a response to structuralist theory um, in university linguistics curriculums. And <clears throat> that in fact, Gandalf's use of language does end up shaping the other characters and the structure of Bilbo's adventures, right? So, I mean, that, those are kind of very kind of broad points that I address in the article, but it's, it all starts just with a couple of research questions, right? So what I want you guys to show up with on Wednesday are a couple of potential questions like this about your proposed subject, right? So, um, have any of you given any thought to this yet, uh, to what you want to do your final project about? You're not in key? What, what do you want to write about? Um, we can take like something from like another class to explore kind of. Like if it's a something where it's a class, can we do that? Yeah, you, you, you can absolutely um, take something that you've read from the class. However, if you want to submit the same paper for more than one class, remember that you have to get my permission and the other instructor's permission. Uh, I kind of have two ideas. So one of them kind of Okay, and I'm, 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 I'm sorry, what was the primary yeah. subject? Um, this one for the canon one, I haven't said the other one yet. Oh, 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 oh okay, yeah, okay. Oh, so, so you're talking about the paper that's due today, the, 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 the draft that's due today. So, 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 you're, so you're looking at like this uh, idea, like, like, like food yeah. as cultural expression. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. What, what about, um, what about the rest of the, what, are, what are some of the things you guys are thinking about um, that you might write and do this final project on? I think I have the material I want to do. I think I want to do the movie color. Okay. Are you familiar with the book? <laughs> there is. Yeah, it's a Philip. It's a Philip. It's a Philip K. Uh, K. Dick book. <laughs> but yeah, you, you can yeah you can absolutely do the film, and you don't necessarily have to reference the book um, to to do a reading of the film. Okay, cool. What about the rest of you? Any ideas? It's okay if the answer is no. Not yet. Okay. All right. So just yeah, try to have something ready for that uh, Wednesday. And again, what we'll we'll do that is sort of. Uh, private conferences. So, you know, first come, first serve. Whoever's here first gets the first 15 minutes, and so on and so forth, right? Okay. Any questions about any of the assignments at all before I proceed? Okay. So, Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
What I want to talk about today is whether or not there's an argument for, there's a good argument for the use value of an education in English, right? Whether there's a good sort of purely utility-oriented argument for getting an education in English. So I know I had you guys do something on this when we first started the course. But let's just revisit this for a minute. I want, like, what do you guys actually hope to get out of your English education? What do you guys want from this degree or from this program? I want to be able to create material that I'm probably. Okay. So you're looking at this as a path to base learning to be a better writer. Yes. Okay. So that is itself a kind of skills oriented path, right? So what else? What else do you guys hope to get out of this? Um, kind of the same page, you know. Um, okay. I want to improve writing, but also different ways that you can teach writing. Okay. Um, I also want to be able to teach people writing. Perspectives on writing instruction. Sean, Sabrina, you guys have anything in particular? Okay. Okay, improving research skills. Construct effective arguments. And I think that this is where one of the big kind of disconnects between students and some faculty occurs, right? Is that all of the answers you guys gave me are skills oriented, right? Nobody gave me an answer that said, like, I want to, um, you know, luxuriate in the aesthetic glory that is, you know, the classics of literature, right? Whether that's what you want to do or not, you're all expecting some kind of other payoff here, right? And there's been a lot of hand, the, re the reason I want to bring this up, the reason I want to talk about this is because there's been a lot of hand wringing over the last, you know, 25, 30 years over whether or not English departments should sell the education they offer as useful or not. And this is actually a much older argument than even several of the people making it think it is, right? So in 1891, Oscar Wilde publishes his novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, in book form for the first time. It had already been published um, in an American magazine um, and serialized, but he, sort of, he revised it and published it as a single volume book. And he added to this book a brief preface that is just a sort of a series of aphorisms about art and life, right? And the last of these the last statement he makes before beginning the content of the novel is all art is quite useless. What do you make of that statement? The idea that art is useless. It's an it is an opinion, yeah. That's one that he's been developing over the course of 
this particular preface, right? But remember, too, this is a statement on art that is coming from an artist, right? So let's try to unpack a little bit what he means by this, right? First off, that he does not mean this as a, mean, as a means of, what's the word I want to use? He actually sees uselessness as a positive value in considering art, right? What he is trying to get people to do is separate aesthetic considerations from ideas of utility, right? He is suggesting that art is good because it's useless, right? Because it doesn't have any practical value, right? It's this silly frippery around the edges of life that is only important to us because we enjoy it or admire it. It doesn't help us make any money. It doesn't help us learn anything. It doesn't serve any practical purpose. That's Wilde's argument, right? It serves no practical purpose, and it shouldn't serve any practical purpose. Now, this is the key argument of a 19th century movement, mostly in Britain and France, called aestheticism. So <clears throat> one of the key texts in early aestheticism is the preface to a novel by the French writer Théophile Gautier um, called Mademoiselle Maupin. Nobody reads Mademoiselle Maupin anymore, but the preface is important largely for a single paragraph in which Gautier argues that the most useful object in your house is your toilet. But you would have to be crazy to admire it, right? So he associates ideas of usefulness with ugliness, right? And ideas of uselessness with beauty. Right? The only reason for keeping a beautiful object around is because it's beautiful. So the rallying cry of most of the aestheticists in the 19th century was art for art's sake, right? That art is something that exists for its own sake, should be appreciated on its own terms, and has nothing to do with practical everyday life. And this has been an extremely influential idea, right? In fact, even going to think back to a lot of what we've said about uh, formalist criticism and formalist thought, right? The idea that the new critics were working from was that you had to understand a poem from the inside on its own terms, right? Without reference to anything outside of it. This is an idea that descends pretty much directly from this art for art's sake notion, right? Now, the argument about use value was fairly new um, in the 19th century, at least in this particular way. But there have been arguments about whether or not literature and art were something good to be taught, dating back to the ancient world. Right? So in 6th century Athens, Plato bans poets from his ideal republic because poets, by producing pretty imitations, lead people away from truth.
Now, Plato's student, Aristotle, in the two volumes of the Poetics, then tries to rebuff that, arguing that no, actually, poetry does serve a very important purpose in the community, right? So talking specifically about tragedy, Aristotle promotes this idea of emotional catharsis, right? That what tragedy produces is a kind of communal purging of negative emotions. Right, so the whole community gets together, you know, once a year, they watch these tragic plays in this festival. They get all of those powerful emotions of pity and fear out. And then they can get back to living normally for the rest of the year, right? So poetry, by helping people get those emotions out, actually serves a vital social purpose. In the Middle Ages, or the early Middle Ages, poetry was also uh, frowned on, particularly by a lot of religious thinkers and religiously oriented philosophers. Um, the philosopher Boethius for example, when he wasn't being imprisoned and tortured by the king of the Ostrogoths, uh, was working along ideas that were really pretty similar to Plato's, right? That the beauty produced by poetry and art is a distraction that takes our minds off of higher things. And given how generally monkish the academic culture of the Middle Ages was, there aren't really a lot of um, responses directly to Boethius' argument. Boethius becomes really influential for quite a long time. Um, <clears throat> now, in the late 16th century, a writer by the name of Stephen Gosson, who is himself a failed playwright, writes a pamphlet called The School of Abuse. in which he argues that the plays in particular that the public enjoys are immoral and lead people away from religion and <clears throat> inculcate bad moral values in the population, right? So are we noticing a trend in the arguments against literature and art. Do we notice a common thread running through all of these so far? On what grounds do these thinkers object to literature and art? I believe there's no utility in it, except for Aristotle. Well, apart from questions of utility, I guess, like, how is utility being defined here? So Aristotle believes that poetry leads us away from moral truth, right? Boethius believes something quite similar, right? That it's a pretty distraction that prevents us from pursuing moral truth. Gosson argues that it, um, that it actually encourages immoral behavior, right? So from what standpoint do they view literature as pernicious, right? What's wrong with it? On what grounds are they criticizing it? As a negative effect. On what specifically? Are 
Exactly, yes. It's a negative moral effect, right? They're focused on the moral impact here of literature. This is going to be important in a moment, right? So the grounds on which its defenders approach the subject also tend to be more, right? So Dawson provokes a response from the poet, Sir Philip Sidney, who writes a defense of poesy to argue that literature is, in fact, a powerful moral teaching tool, right? So most of these early arguments back and forth about the, the use value of literature focus on moral issues and morality, right? Now, one of the things that I asked you to look at for today was a piece by the philosopher Jeremy Bentham. Bentham is the father of a philosophical school called utilitarianism. Have we talked about utilitarianism in this class? We have, okay. Um, I know that a couple of you have been in other classes with me where we discussed this too. Um, so what do you know about utilitarianism? Yes. An idea must be judged solely by its usefulness. And how does a utilitarian define usefulness? What to a utilitarian does a useful idea do? Yes, it produces pleasure and or reduces pain, right? So what Bentham is looking for is what is going to produce the most pleasure in the greatest number of people, or reduce pain amongst the greatest number of people, right? So his argument is that a bar game called pushpin, which is kind of similar um, to tiddlywinks, or to like, like, how many of you have ever been in like a Cracker Barrel, and they have those games on the table, right? You, you jump the little pins, yes. Yeah, so pushpin is kind of like the, early 19th century equivalent of that, right? Bentham is arguing that more people get a charge out of pushpin than they do out of poetry and art. So why should we encourage the study and production of poetry and art when we could just keep people quiet and happy by encouraging them to play pushpin, right? So this is a different attack on our literature, right? This is a different line of reasoning than what we've seen here. Is Bentham's uh, objection to poetry and art based on a moral problem? Does the morality of poetry and art seem to enter into this thought at all here? Not really, right? Morality don't enter into it. What is his prime consideration? The problem is that poetry is not affecting him like it is a simple way of pushpin. Is it that it's not affecting him or that it's not affecting as many people as pushpin? Yeah. Pushpin is more accessible, right? Poetry and art can be difficult, as we all know. Pushpin, anybody can play it. 
So from Bentham's point of view, push pin is more useful than poetry. And thus should be encouraged and supported, right? Now, part of what he's making here is also a kind of class argument, right? When Bentham is writing in the early 19th century, literacy rates in Britain are a lot lower than they are today, particularly among the working classes. Not only that, there's no compulsory education, right? So only those who can afford a private education are taught to appreciate poetry and art. And this class issue is something that does also kind of persist in discussions about humanities majors generally, right? Um, so because Pushpin is open to everyone, it doesn't cost anything to play. There's no entry price. And <clears throat> it gives pleasure to more people. Pushpin is more useful. And that's exactly the kind of argument that Wilde and the aestheticists in the latter half of the 19th century are trying to counter, right? Utilitarianism becomes the dominant philosophical movement in British political life in particular in the 19th century. And Bentham's ideas of producing pleasure and producing pain end up kind of over time evolving into what idea is going to make the most money, right? So by the end of the 19th century, utilitarians are thinking not so much in terms of pleasure and pain benefit as in terms of cost benefit to profit, right? And this becomes an important consideration as university education becomes available to more students in the US and Britain. It's still, so here's the thing about most European university systems, right? Does anybody know how European university systems by and large are different from American systems? Yeah, I, I, there's no particular reason why you would. I'm just you know, asking if anyone was aware of this. One is that um, they are either heavily taxpayer subsidized, so costs are very low, or they're free, right? In several European countries, university education is free. Now, how is that accomplished? Well, in part, by limiting who goes. So a much smaller percentage of people are able to go to university in many of these. So for example, um, if you take the example of, of Ireland, right? You don't have to pay a cent to attend an Irish university if you're an Irish citizen. However, what you need to do at the end of your high school education is take a test called the Leaving Certificate. At the end of the test form, you will then be able to list the departments in which you would like to study at the universities in Ireland at which you would like to study them. Each one has a limited number of seats available, right? So say I want to study English at University College Dublin, right? I make that my first choice on the list. Um, <coughs> Whether or not I can do that depends on the number of seats available that year and the score I get on the exam. So that determines whether or not I get to study what I want where I want to, right? The other issue is that you will typically only study 
one or two subjects in university, right? Um, so we have a, like a general core curriculum for most universities in the US, right? So you have to take a math class, you have to take um, you know, you have to take a couple of science classes, you have to take a couple of English classes, right? You have to take history. Um, by and large in Europe, you will study one or two subjects to the exclusion of all else, right? So if you are studying, or you know, if say you're in England and you're reading English, then all of the courses you take are going to be English courses. Now, <clears throat> where was I going with this? Why did I bring this up? <laughs> I'm not expecting an answer from you. I had a train of thought and suddenly derailed. Um, okay, so when education is free or heavily subsidized, people don't worry as much about potential payoff, right? It's not as important that you make money with a particular degree if you don't have a buttload of loans to pay off, right? If your education didn't really cost very much or didn't cost anything. I think until recently in the United States, that was the situation with public universities, right? Uh, my parents' generation, for example, were able to go to public universities very cheaply. However, relatively few people went to college in fact, today, relatively few Americans go to college. Only about a, th a third of Americans have a college degree, which is a higher percentage than in a lot of other countries, but still like, by no means the majority of the population. Um, whereas, you know, my generation falls somewhere in the middle, right? Like, I had, um, I had loans to pay off, but they weren't crippling. Your generation is looking at something rather different, right? Um, you know, we hear a lot of the news about student debt crisis. And so there's certainly nothing wrong with students wanting to know what kind of return they're going to get on investment from their education, right? So these purely utilitarian arguments that the aestheticists dismissed in the early 19th century um, are actually really pretty relevant to contemporary student life, right? It does matter whether you can get a job after you graduate or not, right? It does matter what skills you learn and whether you can use them. And so this kind of brings us to what the debate has been in contemporary departments about how to frame this, right? All right, one thing that ha started happening in the 1960s, um, a lot more people started going to college. Does anybody know why more people started going to college in the 1960s in the US? Yeah, the GI Bill had already expanded access, right? At least to men. You did also have more institutions going co-ed in the 60s, which was also, um, which tended to lift institutions that went co-ed and to actually harm institutions that didn't. Um, if there are a lot of uh, men, only, men only and women only colleges that are ba barely hanging on right now. Um, but there was another, political issue in the 60s that was driving a lot of people to spend some time in higher education. The civil rights was also happening, and that was desegregated colleges. There was a lot of uh, student organizing happening in the civil rights movement, but that, that wasn't actually um, driving people to attend college. Well, maybe this is just something you guys don't know about. Yeah. You were able to claim exemptions from the draft if you stayed in school, right? In 
fact, you know, several prominent American political figures of the last 20 years arguably stayed in college or in graduate school in order to avoid going to Vietnam, right? Um, you could get deferments. They were called deferments uh, for remaining in school. So <clears throat> what this did was start to dilute the monetary value of certain degrees and to kind of create like a kind of chokehold in some disciplines um, where there were simply too many graduates uh, to accommodate in the workplace with particular degrees, right? Now, <clears throat> this is still a little, a little bit of a problem. This is something that I think universities still have kind of backwards, right? So right now the push is to Try to, like, okay, there are a lot of engineering jobs open, right? So funnel more students into engineering, right? But that's a kind of delicate balance because what happens then if you funnel too many students into engineering? Yeah, it doesn't create more jobs for those extra students, right? Who don't get those available jobs. And if we look at things like engineering, like again, like nothing against the discipline of engineering, right? It's highly important. I personally like bridges not to fall down when I drive over them, right? You know, I prefer, you know, hell, you're wearing a NASA t-shirt, right? You know, that, you know, firing people and stuff off into space would be impossible without engineering. Um, I think of several people I would like to fire off into space, but that's not even there. Um, Engineering and other kind of applied pre-professional disciplines tend to funnel people into specific careers, right? One of the strengths that the humanities has traditionally had which is also sometimes a weakness is that it doesn't funnel you into a specific job, right? There is no specific career waiting for you at the end of an English degree, right? Unless you want to be an English teacher or an English professor, which, you know, given issues in higher ed right now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, it's an okay gig if you can get it, but I wouldn't recommend it right now. Um, so, in what ways is this lack of a specific job outcome a hindrance? Why is it problematic? How might that make it harder to recruit people to major in English? else you can think of that might make this lack of a specific outcome a problem for, a, for an academic discipline. So yeah, it's uncertain because you don't know necessarily what the job you're going to have on the other end is going to look like, right? Any other things you can think of as problematic about necessarily be, um, if there's no specific job waiting for you at the end, that's actually a strength, right? Because it can prepare you for a variety of different career outcomes, right? So the skills you guys were talking about wanting to get at the beginning of class, right? Most of those are things that can be applied in a lot of different jobs, right? Most, kind, most white collar jobs are going to require effective communication skills. They're going to require effective research skills. They're going to require you to be able to evaluate information, right? And you know, the fact of the matter is too, it's like at least for most entry level white collar jobs, by and large, they don't care what you major in, right? 
What matters is that you finish the degree and you sat at a desk for four to six years and proved that you can handle that, that you have that level of discipline. And you know, people with humanities degrees actually do tend to move up in organizations fairly quickly because of the skills that you learn in these disciplines. So in some ways, that lack of a specific outcome is also a strength because it does prepare you for a broad number of possibilities, right? But then the problem in departments themselves is whether or not we sell English as a skill building degree. Right, on the one hand, and there are, there are good arguments for and against both of these positions. Right? On the one hand, we have people coming from this idea that the humanities promote the disinterested study of culture. And everybody understands what I mean by disinterested here, right? Disinterested being like not being motivated by personal financial gain, right? Disinterested here, I guess probably the closest uh, synonym would be objective. So the humanities promote the objective study of culture. And if you are focused on some kind of end goal, like a career, then you are not looking at life and culture disinterestedly, right? If we aggressively try to recruit majors by promising them career benefits, then it hurts our argument that what we are doing is performing objective cultural research. And you know, there is still a good bit of that notion that art and literature are good and important in and of themselves. And that studies which enrich human life and that enrich the soul or the mind in some way, right, are in and of themselves valuable and worthwhile, even if they don't lead to making more money. But we can certainly question the assumptions on which some of these ideas rest, right? Think about this again from this utilitarian point of view, right? What's Bentham's problem with poetry and art versus pushpin? More people get more out of pushpin than the small minority that gets the same thing out of poetry and art. Yeah. The mass appeal of pushpin, right? And that mass appeal of pushpin is in part based on its significantly lower cost of entry, right? Both financially and intellectually. So pushpin is more popular in part because more available. So the question that someone who does want to sell the skills that you get from an English degree might ask is, what am I supposed to tell a student who has to go deeply into debt to major in English about the richness and beauty of the human experience, right? And that that in and of itself is worth taking on this financial burden. So one of the charges that is usually leveled at this notion of the humanities which I don't think is a bad notion, right? I do think that we get a lot out of humanities studies that isn't use, you know, useful or utilitarian or career focused, and that's good, we ought to. But one of the criticisms that's leveled at this 
is that it is an elitist viewpoint. That it is essentially sort of, you know, for people who can afford the expense without having to worry about um, the payoff at the end, right? So we can already then kind of anticipate what sorts of things people would argue in terms of selling English as a skills degree, right? That <clears throat> studying English or studying the humanities prepares you not just for a broad variety of jobs, but also for citizenship. Uh, this, um, a scholar uh, by the name of Martha Nussbaum, who was trained both as a PhD in English and as a lawyer, um, has argued that a humanities degree actually is a really good um, way to prepare people to make informed choices in the voting booth and you know when pressuring elected officials right it helps you know the right kinds of arguments to make to sway your neighbors it helps you know the right kind of art construct the right kinds of arguments to talk to political officials um, and yeah it, it helps you to become more involved and more connected to your culture But also, as we've already noted, right, the skills you learn are useful in almost any job. And there are a couple of arguments that people make for, use, for this sort of skills-focused um, notion of the curriculum that have nothing necessarily to do with content or with the material you learn or what you do with it. Um, some of these are purely sort of questions about recruiting and about diversity, right? Um, in particular, Students of more modest means, people reason, will be more attracted to English if they know that there is something at the end of their four to six years, right? If they know that it will help prepare them for a job. Um, and yeah, a lot of it is based on hand-wringing about declining numbers of humanities majors over the course of the last 30, 40 years. Now, there are plenty of potential reasons why these numbers might be declining. Some of it might be just sort of growth in other disciplines that are more uh, practical, pre-professional, like business, like education, whatever. Um, some of it might be um, to do with some of the issues of the canon that we talked about, right? That some, you know, some of the stuff just doesn't speak to <coughs> contemporary students the way it spoke to T.S. Eliot, right? Um, but what I'd like to try to gauge here is like what you guys think about the merits of both of these arguments, right? Do you think English should be sold as a skills degree and why? Should it be sold as a, sold as a skills degree or as a disinterested inquiry? Or is there some middle ground? I think there's definitely a middle ground because mm -hmm. when I when I first came to GSW, I came to be an engineer, and that uh -huh. felt true when I was, was not good at calculus. <laughs> I worked my butt off, but I tried my own ability. Uh -huh. um, calculus is a bitch. <laughs> but I did learn that what I really did enjoy was the literature classes. 
Yeah. Uh, the reading of material, expanding on the ideas of mm -hmm. material. Yeah. I had, if you gave me an interest in the course, mm -hmm. at, at the same time, I'm not, I'm not rich by any means. I came here on scholarships, and yeah. I'm, I'm hoping to be on scholarships mm -hmm. with your GPA and all that. So I think there's definitely a benefit in advertising, though, because you know, when I first started, I just I didn't see any interest in English. But now that I, I mm -hmm. after I talked to some English professors, they said, oh, no, more places are also looking for um, humanities uh -huh. degrees. And okay. what still keeps me interested in it is just the study of culture. OK, so what drew you in was that you liked the material. And what confirmed your decision was that there was something you could do with this, yeah. And I, you know, I mean, my, my own path was relatively similar. My, my dad was a pipe fitter. Um, I was a scholarship kid. Um, and English isn't often a natural choice for um, <clears throat> somebody from that background, right? Um, but. You know, it did just look like th th this. This was what interested me more than anything else. Uh, what about the rest of you guys? Like, like, what what have your what has your experience been like? Cultivating the interest should be enough, and you shouldn't really need to have to like you shouldn't really need to have to sell it. Okay. What about you two? Uh huh. It should be advertised as to Okay. Mm-hmm. What about you, Keith? Yeah, is, is a nursing degree much good to you if you decide you don't want to be a nurse? Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I think we're like, um, at least like from what I've got from you know, being here a couple of years and talking to students, I think um, the three of you started as English majors, right? Um, Nick's experience, at least historically in this department, has been a little more typical. Most of our English majors usually start out doing something else and then get drawn in by lit class and you know come over you know come over to the dark side um, but yeah um, I think you know like I have tended lately to lean towards this position that we do need to promote skills but it's interesting that you guys are all saying that what drew you to the major wasn't the potential skills, right? That what you started with was interest in the material, even if you didn't initially realize you were interested in the material. And that, that kind of love for the stuff came first. So yeah, um, this leaves me in a bit of an interesting quandary, OK. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the pat answer to that is because you got to eat. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I, I, I think like one of the things I just wanted you guys to, to, to come away with from today is that there is this long-standing argument, like dating back to the ancient world and literary studies, about whether or not literature and the study of it is or should be useful. And that when people in the academy today are sort of going back and forth about whether this is, you know, you know, whether we should be focusing on aesthetic issues or whether we should be simply using the material to recruit or whether we should be focused on material gain and sort of more concrete skill building, um, that this is not new, right? That this is something that has been with us from just about the beginning of recorded time. Um, so does anybody have any questions about any of this? Does anybody have any questions about anything that I might reasonably be able to answer for you? Okay, uh, then we'll stop there. Um, and remember, Wednesday you are coming with your subject and a couple of proposed research questions, right? All right, great, so we'll see you then.